Now we will turn to our panel on open records in Alabama. We are very grateful to Kim Bailey for moderating the panel today. Kim is a member of the League of Women Voters of Greater Tuscaloosa. A native of Indiana, she calls Tuscaloosa home after residing there for 27 years. Kim has spent her entire career at the University of Alabama system where she is currently the Director of Information Systems and Digital Content. She's an avid reader and loves the challenge of building Lego models. Take it away, Kim. Good morning and welcome to our panel on Open Records in Alabama. The panelists um, will have two minutes to answer each question. They will have an opportunity to respond to every question that is asked. And at the end, we will allow them two minutes for closing remarks. Um, Carol Prickett, you should see her window pop up. She will give you a warning when you have 30 seconds left and then again at uh, 15 seconds. So just keep an eye on, on Carol's window as soon as we see that come up. Um, participants are invited to send questions to chat or email them to Steven Stetson. And I think we'll have a slide up um, in a little while with his email address. So you can send those in. Those will most likely be for a later follow-up. We're not sure if we'll have time to, um, to get to those. So you can um, just send those and then we will send those back out later. So now I would like to introduce the, um, members of the panel. First, we have Sonny Brassfield. He serves as executive director of the Association of County Commissions of Alabama. The association speaks with one voice for county government in Alabama and is a consistent advocate for the programs and people who manage and deliver services to Alabama's citizens. Tish Gotel Fox is the legal director for the ACLU of Alabama. After law school, she quickly discovered her love for the law as a tool to fight for and protect people. Felicia Mason is executive director of the Alabama Press Association. She is the first woman to hold the position in its 150 year history. And Senator Orr was supposed to join us, um, but he sends his regrets uh, this morning. He's, he um, is recovering from a illness. Okay, so first we'll get started now with our questions. Ms. Mason, we'll start with you. Senator Orr sponsored Senate Bill 165, the Alabama Public Records Act. In your opinion, uh, why did it not pass? And if you could describe the fundamental fault lines of disagreement. Well, I, I think with any <clears throat> piece of major legislation, you, um, you can expect to have a multiple year um, exercise in trying to work out all the differences. Sonny and I have worked um, on open meetings many years ago and um, it's, you know, when you have two sides that they're not, we're not necessarily um, completely opposite, but we're coming from it, uh, coming to it from different directions. It just takes a while to do it. And I think we learned that <clears throat> We started out uh, with a comprehensive bill of 165 with Senate Bill 165. And um, we eventually came around to um, it being um, more uh, of an amend amendment type of bill where we were just looking at uh, issues that were most relevant to the public. Um, but as I said, with anything that um, is, is a piece of major legislation, it just takes a while. And if, if, if Alabama Press Association got everything it wanted, I would say that the counties and the cities and the school boards and all of those that we're working with would, would, were probably not 
uh, treated fairly. If they got everything we wanted, they wanted, then the public would not be treated fairly. So you've got to, it takes time to compromise and that's kind of where we are right now. Okay, thank you. Ms. Fox? Well, good morning and thank you for including the ACLU in this panel. Um, I think that one of the challenges of managing uh, legislation and expectations here in Alabama, um, we have a very short window to get a lot of work done. Uh, and when it comes to something like an overhaul of our Open Records Act, um, it's just not something that would be completed in the regular course of business for our short legislative session. Um, I was thrilled, the affiliate was thrilled to see the recognition that Alabama's Open Rights Act needs some type of repair. Um, it's a fairly toothless uh, mechanism right now. Um, we certainly are of the mind that more transparency is better, uh, but we also understand that we don't want to have um, every curiosity thrown at the Board of Education, the governor, um, ADOC. We don't want every single wondering and request taking up time, energy, and effort from the work that needs to be done on behalf of the people of Alabama. Um, but we know that what is currently uh, the course of dealings isn't working. Alabama is one of the least transparent states in the union, and that needs to be changed. Thank you. And Mr. Brassfield, what would you like to add? Sure. Uh, th thanks again to the league for inviting us, and uh, good Saturday morning to everyone. I think I think Felicia uh, kind, kind of put her finger on uh, how things have moved forward on this issue up until this point. Uh, there are um, – a whole host of interest involved in something this comprehensive. Now, I'm, I'm here to talk about the counties and, and uh, we can dig as deep as you want to on our, our concerns as we uh, move forward this morning. Uh, our concerns will line up uh, fairly well with the concerns of the cities uh, and the boards of education, uh, but not exactly. Those, those organizations have their own concerns as well. Uh, state agencies have, have a different set of concerns uh, universities have another set, public hospitals have another set of issues. Uh, and so uh, the, the bill as introduced this past year was, was I think, uh, almost the exact same bill introduced in the 2020 session, which of course was cut short by COVID and there was very little work um, that, that was possible on the legislation that year. So, so I don't know that, that the advocates for the bill should feel like uh, they're behind or that um, or, or that there's any reason to believe that something uh, positive can't be passed. But that bill did completely repeal the existing law and, and created a completely new statute. Uh, and for us at the county level, that was of concern. Uh, we have decades of um, court case law that, 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 that quite honestly, we weren't real comfortable with throwing away and starting over with um, complete new definitions and those kinds of things. I think most of that got worked out, quite honestly. Uh, the Press Association uh, invested an enormous amount of time and effort and elbow grease and, and, and honestly resources in, uh, in helping us move the ball forward uh, during the session. And I think we made, we made substantial progress. Didn't get there uh, all the way, but we made progress. Okay, so for the next question, we'll start with you, Mr. Brassfield. So as you were having these conversations, um, what stakeholders do you feel were not at the table and were there specific perspectives that were missing from the conversation? Well, I, you know, from, from our perspective, um, you know, 
the, the local government groups, cities, counties, school boards, uh, we met collectively with the Alabama Press Association, the three of us. Um, I, I, I do know that Brad English, uh, who works with Felicia, would leave meetings with us and go to meetings with other groups. Now, I, I, I wasn't present with those meetings, so I don't know uh, all the groups that were involved, uh, but I know the Alabama Press Association knows how to move a piece of legislation along. So I don't, I don't think, uh, at least from our perspective, that that the, the current posture of the effort has anything to do with there not being a comprehensive effort to, to involve everyone. Um, this, this is a very complicated issue, and I know we'll get into some of those complicated details going forward, uh, but, but it's easy to say we ought to have more transparency uh, in today's digital world. It's easy to say Alabama's open meetings law is the weakest in the country. I don't, I don't know that I agree with that necessarily. Uh, but, but resolving uh, this issue in a positive way uh, is complicated. And so I, I, from where we sit, I don't, I don't really have any kind of criticism about who was involved and who wasn't involved. Uh, from, from our perspective, we had lots of negotiations uh, started. We had daily access with Brad and the folks from the Press Association. Uh, we worked on specific language, the kinds of things that we did. Uh, Felicia, I think way back in 2005, I guess, somewhere in there when we were working on uh, rewriting uh, the open meetings law. So, so I, I don't think that's a criticism at all. Okay, Ms. Fox, what about you? Well, I think that part of the challenge here is really addressing the places where we have um, the least movement in gaining public access to information of public interest and concern. Um, over the course of the pandemic, I am sure that many people had questions or concerns about how the university systems were determining whether and when to return to classes the protocol of what was going to occur. And indeed, coming up to the fall, we have those questions and concerns. Um, I don't know that we've heard very much about including the special interest needs and concerns of a university system in uh, being more transparent in how they conduct their business. Um, I would also say that when it comes to public hospitals or other uh, deliverers of public health information, we don't have a lot of transparency and information from those actors. And as far as reconciling the proposed legislation for Alabama with other pre-existing laws, interests and concerns, I think we really are at a place where we can grandfather in some of the case law that informs us in how, uh, how much the government is obligated to provide while still providing a structure that works for a modern social environment in which we could electronically provide access for a lot of information that would free up hands uh, to not have to do it directly, but just be transparent in offering that information to the public. Thank you. And Ms. Mason, what, what about you? Are there perspectives missing from your? Well, anytime, again, you start off on um, down the path of, of comprehensive legislation, you want all of the interested parties at the table. And a lot of the, um, groups that you mentioned, Ms. Falk, uh, were there and will continue to be there. Um, they, the, the diff they may have different perspectives. Your schools and your hospitals have um, sensitive information that we have to be um, aware of and we have to be uh, respective of, respectful of. Uh, but I think we had, uh, as Sonny mentioned, uh, those that are most um, interested in uh, the day-to-day -day, um, public records um, from the record holders perspective 
were included. And we did have many, many meetings. And Sonny, I may be wrong about this, but I think what, uh, when, when the session ended, we were on version 12, 11 or 12 of, um, of, of this bill. So to, to get through a bill that was, what, 20, 30 pages long and, and uh, get to 11 iterations of that, that's a lot of work. And so um, you certainly want to be, and we want to be where we are including everyone's voice. The, the law doesn't work. If it's not, um, and no, no, nobody's, not everybody's going to be happy with it. We don't always get everything we want, but we certainly have to be in, we have to be willing to hear all those voices. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Ms. Fox, we'll start with you on this question. Um, we live in one of the most partisan and polarized moments in anyone's memory. Do you believe this issue became a conservative versus liberal issue? Um, what, what do you see as the dividing lines? I actually don't think that this is an issue uh, that divides that way. Um, historically, people in power have always wanted to reduce the disclosure of information to the general public and the general public, depending upon their perception of what the government is quote unquote hiding, has wanted to dig deeper. That is not a conservative issue. That is not a progressive issue. Uh, that is an issue of free society and the balance between safety, security, private information uh, security and the obligations of a democracy. What I think is important is to identify the concerns of the stakeholders. Uh, someone in the chat said, what is it that each of us cares about? For the ACLU, we care about transparency of information because the government has a limited role or should have a limited role in our everyday lives. Now, what that means ultimately is that for the average citizen in the state of Alabama, you pay your taxes, you go about your business, you raise your family, and you want safety and security while maintaining your liberty. What we ask is that anytime a public servant acts on behalf of the people, that that person may be held accountable, that they can explain what they are doing and why, and that those who would seek that information get easy access to it under all circumstances. Okay, thank you. Ms. Mason, what do you think? Are there- um... I, I agree with Ms. Fox. I do not see this as a partisan issue. Uh, it's a public issue and citizens, whether they are conservative or liberal, are concerned about this and it affects them every day in their daily lives. And uh, I, I, just, I, I just don't see partisanship in this issue. Mr. Brassfield, what, what would you like to add? Sure. I I don't, I don't think this is an issue that uh, will divide or, or during the last two sessions has divided along party lines in any way. Um, you know, it's hard for me, even on Saturday morning, to let a comment go that said that the people in power seek to always reduce the disclosure of information. Um, I've spent the last 34 years working with county officials and county employees around the state, and um, that, that's not how I see it in, in any shape or form. Um, and, and quite honestly, coming at this issue with that approach is probably um, one of the issues, that reasons why it's been difficult to reach uh, agreement at this point, just to be quite honest. But with regard to um, there, there being, uh, you know, a Republican or a Democrat side or a liberal or conservative side on this issue, I don't, I don't think that uh, had anything to do with what happened in the 20. 
uh, 21 session or will going forward. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, we've sort of touched on this, but let's expand on it just a little bit. How are the special interest groups who are pushing the reforms perceived by lawmakers and decision makers? Um, what are some concerns that you have in support and against the proposed bill? So we will start with Ms. Mason for this question. Gosh, you kind of need to have Senator Orr here to answer that, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, uh, with varying lobbying groups that um, I guess you would call a special interest. Um, but, you know, we, we work every day, uh, day in and day out with legislators, not just on this issue, but on uh, many issues. Sonny's been doing this longer than I have. Uh, right, Sonny? Aren't you older than me? I'm just kidding. Um, but, you know, um, I, I think that um, the, the relationship um, between the legislators and the lobbyists, uh, obviously, they understand it's an important issue for us to be there advocating for it, and they respect that. And so, um, you know, we're, we are one of many groups that are there. Uh, proposing legislation and um, and working on behalf of our, you know, for us it's the public and 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 the press uh, to have access to public records. But I, I just think in general, um, I, I think the perception would be um, that if we're there and we are making the effort, spending the time, it's important to us and it's important to a lot of other people as well. Okay, thank you. Mr. Brassfield, what do you think? Well, well, I, I will stipulate that, that I am both older and uh, more tired than Felicia is, uh, but, but we've, uh, we've worked on lots of issues together over the years. And uh, I mean, I think the Alabama legislature, especially the leadership and those that are involved uh, in, in, in much of the, the movement of significant legislation like this, I think they understand that everybody has uh, a point of view on an issue like this and that there has to be time and quite honestly room for for those groups to resolve the issues that that are important to both of them so um, you know if the question is does does the um, does the Alabama legislature give more um, <clears throat> excuse me more credibility on this to counties more credibility on this to the press association I would say I, I don't think they see it that way I think they understand that that the Alabama Press Association um, ha, has a has an angle at which they come at this issue. Um, it's it's understandable. Um, it is justifiable, and that Alabama counties have their own angle as well. So um, I, I, I really don't think uh, the legislature sees this um, perhaps in the way that those outside the process might might believe. Um, quite honestly. The legislature on this issue, as they did on, on open meetings years ago, turned to the Alabama Press Association and us and said, go work it out. Um, and, and quite honestly, that's how this process works. Uh, at some point, the, the leadership and those who are, are feel strongly on both sides that are elected members, they, they stick their toe in there and say, y'all keep working. Um, so, so I, don't, I don't think anybody's getting any blame if that's kind of the focus of the question. Okay, Ms. Fox, what about you? I, I think for me, it's interesting hearing about the stakeholders in this process. Uh, from my perspective as the lead litigator for the ACLU, um, my stakeholders are generally uh, private individuals who have questions or concerns about how the government is impacting their lives. Um, I'm not certain that the concerns and interests of the people are always at the forefront of legislators' concerns or the press association. 
uh, the, the question comes here in, in the comments about uh, government officials who are concerned that more rigorous transparency will create more work for them. Um, I don't think that that's what the press uh, is concerned with or advocating or addressing, but I do think that the average citizen might have interest or concerns that would require a bit more work uh, if they were going to be able to get the transparency that they want. Um, and I'm not certain whether or not those interests and concerns are always placed at the forefront in the legislative process at this juncture. Um, I am certainly um, open to the idea that as we get to a more finished product, uh, we start dealing not with the document requests of institutions and pillars of our democracy, but the individuals uh, who have very specialized questions. Um, and for the ACLU, we want to speak for those individuals. Uh, the people who really just need access to a videotape, not the full economic disclosure of a department. Okay, thank you. Um, and Ms. Fox, we'll start with you on this question. Um, so this is changing tactics just a little bit, but when these requests come in, um, how do you balance access to information with individuals' privacy? Well, I think that one of the central concerns for the ACLU is that the individual and their closely held private information are protected as much as possible while still giving the public access to information that they may need. For example, um, if I ask the question, how many heart attacks were presented at X public hospital? I am not asking who are the individuals who were believed to have been suffering a heart attack which would require that you disclose private medical information about individuals. I am asking for broader anonymous information so that I can do my research into whatever I'm doing. Um, I think that what we often find is that the strenuous protection of private information is used as an excuse to avoid giving broader information that may have negative implications. And while privacy is tantamount for the ACLU, the access to broader community information is key and important. Um, as we move forward, I think it's a false dichotomy to claim that privacy concerns prohibit any type of disclosure. And it's something that the Alabama Open Records Act seems to tolerate entirely too often. Thank you, Mr. Brassfield. Well, well, certainly the privacy issues, you know, for us are one of the, the things that are on the table that we have to try to address in any new piece of, of legislation. From, from our perspective, those relate to, um, you know, personnel records, those relate to uh, things in, in law enforcement that are protected for, for those reasons. Uh, and, and it also relates to things like economic development, uh, recruitment activities while we're still trying to secure uh, new, new businesses in the state. I think those are the kind of things that everyone would, would agree are to be disclosed. Uh, the, the, the question's when, uh, and, and those are the kinds of things that when you get around the negotiating table, you try to um, 
f find a workable solution. As Felicia said, when we started, probably not everything that those who would advocate uh, for complete and immediate openness of, of all documentation, uh, probably not exactly what they would want and probably not exactly what uh, those who, who have difficulty, as is mentioned in one of the questions, uh, having enough staff to respond to, to request to questions, especially if we, uh, if we begin to open up this process to electronic requests from all over the country or, or perhaps even all over the world, uh, there, there is a concern about the ability to respond to those requests, especially by small governments that may have two or three people who work there. Uh, but the privacy issues can be worked out um, a, a, as long as everyone concedes and understands that, that it's more about timing than it is about the information. And Ms. Mason? Well, certainly privacy is, an, is a concern for all of us. I mean, those of us sitting around the table negotiating are individuals too. And so we understand that privacy issues are to be um, part of this discussion. I think Sonny's right. I think we can do that. I think some of the issues that he brought up we addressed in the open meetings law uh, when, uh, for instance, when you're talking about um, economic development, they, it's when, it, when is it disclosed, not if it is disclosed. And that part of, um, I, I think the confusion that comes in with that in our law is how vague it is now and where it really doesn't address that at all. And part of the reason that we're here doing this is to uh, create uh, more, I wouldn't say definitions, but more clarity that uh, will, will be guidance for the public and the press and guidance for the government officials or those who hold the records. Um, and, but getting back to the, the core question, privacy is always a concern and it gets more so every day. But, um, you know, I think we are, we are given the tools to address that. We've just got to figure out how to, how to get it into the statute. Okay, thank you. So we, we know that there are others, many other states who have um, more, mm, I don't know, uh, broader laws or open records um, than Alabama. So what problems have other states experienced? You know, are, are the problems that may come up with a more open records um, act, does that, are those scare tactics or are, is there empirical evidence that other states have um, you know, that they've experienced problems when they open up their records. So, you know, what, what do, can we learn from other states as we move forward here? Mr. Rossfield? Well, uh, as, as Felicia said, I've spent the last 200 years representing counties here in Alabama. So I'm not, I'm not uh, really hold myself out as an expert on uh, uh, the difficulties that have been encountered in other states. I think we have We've shifted in terms of how we handle things legislatively here uh, in, in Alabama, and we try to spend a great deal of time looking at other states. We've had discussions. Uh, some provisions of the bill that were, were introduced came from Tennessee uh, and, and their uh, statute. I, I do think it's important for everybody involved in this process, uh, certainly everybody this morning. Uh, if, if, if you go to Alabama's open records law, uh, it, it, it's about three sentences long. And so if you said, golly, we have a horribly short open records law, there's no definitions in it, there's no provisions for time, that, you know, all of these things that you would list that you find in all the other statutes around the country. Well, the truth is Alabama's courts have established all of those things. Uh, we, we all know what a public writing is. There, you know, there's been scores of litigation about that. Now that definition is not in the statute, uh, but that definition has been defined by the court and it carries just as much weight as it would if it were, were written in the statute. So um, 
I think I think the frame that many people who uh, who, who don't work in this every day may you know may see uh, uh, that that's around the whole issue of up, open records is our our laws three sentences long, uh, therefore our law is bad. Uh, I, I do think from anyone's perspective, our law needs improving, our law needs expanding, our law needs you know, a more specific definition, but our law is much more than the three sentences you see in the code book. Now, I would actually say that uh, relying on case law and development through court to understand our Open Records Act is in and of itself a problem because that therefore means that the court has written and defined what our Open Records Act means or says, rather than the legislators doing it, rather than the legislature doing the hard work of defining and holding accountable and placing uh, what is or is not to be covered under the law. And I would further go on to say that for the average person, who wants to understand what our open records law requires, requests, and will accept, it's unreasonable to expect that person to have to go to case law and basically act as their own lawyer to figure out the outer limits of what our Open Records Act will do, especially when our court records are not easy to gain access to they are not freely available to every person under all circumstances. The ability to pull up the act, read it, and to understand the outer limits of what that act can and cannot do should be on the face of the legislation. It shouldn't require that you have a juris doctorate to understand under what circumstances the government can or can deny your information request. Ms. Mason? Well, certainly um, uh, it, it is difficult for um, to get all the information related to uh, public access uh, given that it's spread out. And, you know, certainly we should have done this many years ago. Uh, but here we are now trying to do just that. And um, I think as, as Sonny said, we looked around at what some other states are doing and how it, the practices um, of, of their government officials and um, take for instance, our, our law doesn't say or, or put a time limit on when a government body has to respond. That's important. That's something that's important to us. And there are lots of different examples throughout um, the other state statutes. And so finding one that works for us is, is something that we're working for. Um, and it, you know, what, what you're describing as uh, it being very difficult and you have, having to um, be a lawyer to figure it out, it, if it's not something you deal with every day, that's true. But I mean, that's why we're here. That's what we're doing. And that's, uh, we're certainly attempting to try to put something together that's, that works. It works for the public. It works for government officials and government entities. And it's easily understood. OK, now um, I believe this is um, a question that might have been in the chat. Um, so it's, it's, we'll start with Ms. Mason on this one. Some local government officials say more robust transparency will create too much work for them. Do you believe that's true? And is there any chance of open records legislation coming with funding to digitize or increase man hours? I don't know that I can address the funding issue. Um, I think that having uh, um, having more work being put on the government officials is, it certainly is a concern for them, but, um, we, you know, we're not opening anything that is currently closed. The exceptions remain the same. Um, 
but there are areas in our state because we are primarily a rural state where you have a um, you do not have a large staff to be able to say, you know, I I need this document and it's you know, regardless of where it is and and it's um, you know it's a big it's a big document. That's an issue we've got to work out. It's a concern for the for the record holder. Sonny can probably address that better than better than I can. Um, but it is just it, it's just something that we need to have. Um, we, we need to have defined, and I, as I said with the last question, something that we will have a, a, a specific number of days you have to respond. Now, not necessarily hand over the material. Um, and, and, and someone mentioned earlier, we have to recognize that um, we don't want um, it, we don't want it to just open it up to anyone can ask for anything from anywhere, um, just because, you know, that when you pick out the lowest common denominator in, in the what if situation, and someone comes in and wants eight years of this or that, that's a concern for the, for the uh, record holder. And we've just got to work through those issues. Okay, Mr. Brassfield, this is kind of your wheelhouse. How do you feel? <laughs> Thanks. Well, uh, F F Felicia knows exactly what I'm about to say. The, the, the question about additional work and additional cost uh, depends on whether we're talking about documents that the entity has in its possession or whether the request is for information. Let me, let me give you an example. Uh, you show up at the Crenshaw County Courthouse yesterday afternoon. There are three people that work in the, the county commission office. Uh, uh, an accounts payable clerk, an accounts receivable clerk, clerk, and the county administrator. If you say, okay, they're, they're resurfacing County Road 7, I'd like to see the contract on that. I'd like to see the cost. Uh, that's a document the county has in its possession, and the county can get that and hand that to you for you to see it over the counter without much trouble and without much cost. If you show up and say, you're resurfacing County Road 7, I want to know how many times has it been resurfaced in the last 30 years? Who were the companies that did it? How much, how much did each you know, project cost? How long did it take? All of those requests, that's all public information. You should have access to it, but somebody's got to pull all that together. And so um, those are some of the things we, we honestly have been trying to work through. How do, you, how do you differentiate between those two things? One thing doesn't cost anything doesn't take any time at all. Uh, another request is legitimate. It's, it's public information. You, you have access to it. How do we put that document together and whose responsibility is it for paying for the research? Uh, and in some places that's an issue. In some places, you know, there, there's plenty of staff. So uh, again, one of those things we're working on. I think that something that we also need to uh, begin to be honest about is that although the state of Alabama um, is a relatively rural state, the uh, advantages of technology are bridging gaps in, in ways that we never could have imagined even 20 years ago when I graduated from law school. I think that part of what we need to do both legislatively and practically is have a plan to make electronic access possible from a date certain forward of basic raw data that we know is of interest to the public, to economists, to historians, uh, to all of the different kinds of information that people generally see. While we figure out a methodology to give electronic access to contemporary documents from five, 10, 15 years ago. I also think that we need to give serious consideration to a different access policy 
for quote unquote ancient documents. That is documents that are 50 years or older, but we know we still have access or research interest. For a police investigation that occurred in 1972, there's no reason generally that those records shouldn't be made available to a criminologist who's doing research about a particular criminal event. And I think that if we start thinking about it that way, we may at least build from this point forward a more transparent apparatus. Okay, thank you. So we'll start, Ms. Fox, with you. Would you support penalties for failure to comply with open records requests? And what about appeals to rejections? What might that look like? I actually think that the Constitution requires an appeals process. Um, I, I wrote in the chat that generally when a custodian fails to provide covered open records request information, there is very little that one can do to enforce short of filing suit. That's highly inefficient. It takes up a lot of time, energy, and effort, both for the custodian and for the party seeking the information. Um, and so I am not settled on penalties. But I do think that it is critical to have a transparent process in which someone seeking information is advised as to why they have not received that information and a formal statement to that end. Um, often when I am filing public records requests, I just don't get an answer. Not that I am denied the documents that I am seeking, but just flat out silence. And if someone from the ACLU can't get responsiveness from a record custodian, what is uh, Mr. Jones of no particular background interest or concern going to get when he is seeking documents or information? Um, I, I think that there needs to be a formalizing process. And again, that is just going to take up more time, energy, and resources. But I think it is valuable and worth it to the Alabama public that they have at least that courtesy. Okay, Ms. Mason? Well, we certainly think that there needs to be some sort of independent appeals process it, it, it is true that now when you're denied a record, there's hardly anything you can do but to go to court. And that's just not an efficient way uh, for anybody, not for the press or the public. So um, that's one avenue that we are um, seeking is to get some sort of independent um, ombudsman or something that e either side can go to, whether they are, are you know, believe they have a document that is not public, as well as the public being able to go get it. As far as fees, um, yes, I think there should be some sort of penalty. It shouldn't be um, an exorbitant amount of money, but there, there shouldn't, there's, you know, it, that's kind of what puts teeth into the law. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, one, one, cornerstone of what we're trying to uh, get is, is, a, is a limited number of days that a, a um, uh, document holder has to respond because not responding um, is, it should not be an option. There should be some sort of limit. Now, what that is, how many days and so forth is kind of where um, I think the group is working on to, to try to get that. Um, but yes, I, I certainly think that they are, there should be something other than going to the court system, which is slow and costly, uh, that, that would be a resolution 
for a document that has been denied or just has been a request that's been ignored. Mr. Brasfield? Well, well, the issue of um, some step between the request being made and filing something in court, um, what, what that step is and how it works um, was, was one of the things that we spent the most time on this past session uh, trying, trying to talk through. Uh, Felicia mentioned there were, there were 12 versions. Uh, Felicia, remind Brad that he owes me lunch. I, I, I predicted when we started that, that we would have it at more than 10 versions, and he said no way. Uh, but but, but we, we, we didn't resolve that issue. I understand the concerns uh, of, of those who, who show up um, you know, at, at, at a public entity, make a request, uh, get no response within a reasonable time limit. I think we had a good bit of that worked out last session. Um, the, the penalty issues for us, the bill as introduced, uh, would have had those penalties levied personally against the public employee rather than against the public body. That was of concern to us. I think we got, I think we got most of that worked out uh, as, as well. Um, we do, just to be you know, transparent here on a Saturday morning, uh, we're not particularly excited about a state employee being able to tell a public body uh, whether or not a, a document is 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 public and, and should be disclosed. I think if if uh, you had any state agency here, any of the universities here, any school here, any any municipality here, I think everybody would say the same thing. Should there be an intermediate step? We don't have an opposition to that. Is the immediate step? a state employee with the power to overrule a county governing body, you know, we're, we've still got to work on that some. Sorry, you said what the enforcement should not look like. What should it look like? Oh, you're muted. It, you, yeah. You were yeah. muted for a minute. Did you uh, did you start with me? Can yes, you say that I'm again? Sorry. Yes. So yeah. So you said um, that what the enforcement from your perspective should not look like. What do you think it should look like? Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, uh, we've mentioned this a couple of times already. You know, we uh, the press association in the counties um, sat down over probably a year, Felicia, something like that, and completely rewrote Alabama's uh, open meetings law. Uh, a few years ago, that process worked so well. I, we've amended it, I think, three times since then to make uh, what I think the press association would consider improvements. Uh, and, and those things occurred without a whole lot of knuckle busting and finger pointing. Uh, we, we worked through that. The, the open meetings law has has an expedited, um, less expensive, uh, more direct court avenue than than what would be used. Uh, using the, the regular process in civil procedure. Um, you know, for us, I think something like that, that, uh, that would make it easier for us to get in front of an impartial person, uh, make it less expensive, uh, shorten the time limit. I think those are things that, that, that for us seem reasonable. Um, we, we, again, we have concerns about um, a state employee, I mean, it has nothing to do with the state. We have concern about any kind, any employee on their own having the ability to dictate to a public body. But is there a, is there a shortened, less expensive, less complicated way to do it? Uh, you know, we think the open records law, open meetings law would be a place to, to start that discussion. Okay, that was sort of a follow-up. So um, Ms. Mason or Ms. Fox, do you have any, any additional comments? on that topic? I, I do. Um, I think that part of what I bring to this conversation is perhaps a naive belief that documents and information generated by a public service employee are by their nature appropriate for public consumption and the exception should not consume the rule. Um, and so from my perspective, 
a lot of information that we are talking about, um, there really doesn't need to be this high level analysis of whether or not it should be disclosed. The high level function is it's not going to be disclosed. Do we have clear guidance as to why it's not? And everything else is open and fair game. Now, I understand that sometimes the requests are asking for a synthesis of information, the creation of something. And I'm not necessarily certain that government, uh, that custodians have an obligation to create the thing that's being sought. If they have the raw data that's being asked for, disclose it as a matter of course. But the creation of data, I certainly think that that is a level of uh, provision that may be excessive. And I think that the nuance between what is and is not creating new information is something that could statutorily be defined and should statutorily be defined. But the default should be disclosure with non-disclosure being the exception that calls for review or analysis by a higher figure or an attorney. Ms. Mason, what are your thoughts? Well, I think the idea of an independent um, appeals process is, is just one of the issues that we're, try, we're struggling with. Um, I don't think um, anyone, any group is against that. It's just, who should it be? As, as Sonny said, we don't think it ought to be a state employee. And so, um, you know, going back to the courts is something that we're trying to avoid. But that is, I think, a very good example of a complicated issue that has many different sides and many different, um, uh, I, I, many, many different aspects that we're just going to have to work out. And it's not easy and it takes time. In a perfect world, absolutely. Anything that's open is open and there should never be a question about it. But, you know, we don't live in a perfect world. We never have, we're not going to, not, not on earth anyway. And so we just have to work around these issues and see, you know, where can we find the common ground that would get us to where we wanna be. Okay, thank you. So um, this will be our last question before moving into closing statements. Um, you all seem very, open to, you know, having this law pass. And so what sort of work is being done between the legislative sessions to work out the kinks and disagreements? Um, is there a conversation and some consensus building going on during this time? And we'll start with um, Ms. Mason. Well, as Sonny mentioned, he's going to have to get with Brad, who is works in my office and works on this day to day in the legislature, you know, for lunch. We have not done a lot of negotiations since the um, legislative session ended. I suspect as we move through the fall and get ready for January that uh, we will get back to this. Um, you know, everybody, when the legislature is over with and you've spent you know, three days a week. Well, th this legislative session was different because you didn't have real access to the state house. But after you spend those three intense days working on a, a myriad of, of bills, not just this bill, all of us have different, this is not the only thing any of us are working on. Um, and so you kind of want to step back and take a break. And we all generally have meetings um, our association meetings in the summertime. So, you know, we're going to have to come back around, but certainly before January uh, when the uh, 2022 legislative session starts, I think we will have uh, circle back around to everybody, try to get with Senator Orr and see where we go. And Ms. Fox? 
I would say that at this particular moment in history, um, Alabama, both as a state and its larger municipalities are getting generational change funding from the federal government that has the potential to really um, alter the trajectory of what our state and our municipal actors are able to do for the people of Alabama. Uh, I think that it's important that some of that CARES Act funding go towards building more transparency between uh, custodial record holders and the general public. And I would encourage everyone who is in attendance to be part of the process in your area and in the state of Alabama in encouraging that some of that funding go towards building greater access to public records, documents, information. Um, I think that technology is going to be key in whatever we do for Alabama transparency moving forward. We are in a place where 250,000 households lack reliable access to internet services or to cell phone services. And we could use this funding to improve that number and to expand access to our government with that funding. And I think that that is part and parcel of what our legislature needs to be called to do when we see a call for a special session, which we know is imperative to occur sometime in the early fall. Ms. Bressfield? Felicia's right. We, uh, we really didn't have access to the Alabama State House this session, which made negotiation a little, a little more tricky. Um, I did learn that if I stay out of the Alabama State House, we can pass all our legislation. Uh, so, so maybe what I learned this year is that, that you know, I ought to do less work rather than more. Uh, but uh, this is probably not, in my opinion, uh, an issue that, that's going to be resolved while the legislature is in session. Um, uh, especially not in an election year, uh, and and especially not with with so many other major issues in front of the Alabama legislature. We we've created a committee of county administrators to help us more formalize uh, our position uh, for for the negotiating process uh, on on a few issues. We've talked about some of those this morning, uh, but uh, you know. I think that most of the hard work on an issue like this is, has to take place when the legislature is not in session. Uh, once the session starts in, the, in, in a typical year, uh, about 600 pieces of legislation that are introduced impact the county government in one way or another. Uh, so it becomes very difficult with our staff for, for somebody on our policy team to sit down and work out something this complicated. Uh, if you get it close, and you only have a few things um, uh, to, to resolve, then maybe that can happen. Uh, but, but, you know, honestly, this is gonna be a tough one. Just, just you know, just again, just to be honest on Saturday morning, this, this is a very complicated issue. Easy to say, ought to be more transparency, really, really difficult to put the words on the paper. Thank you so much. Um, and now it's hard to believe, but we have you know, are coming upon the end of our, our hour and change here. Um, and so we're ready for closing remarks. And, and we will start those with Ms. Fox. Thank you, Kim. And again, thank you League of Women Voters of Alabama for inviting the ACLU to participate. Uh, transparency is the key element to all of the other civil rights and civil liberties work that goes on for the ACLU affiliate. Uh, the ability to seek information from the government and to compare 
that information to what we believe should be the course of dealings or the best course as laid out by the Constitution um, is critical. The work that goes into transparency is vital to continuing our republic as it currently stands. I, I, I thank uh, Mr. Brassfield and Ms. Mason for the hard work, energy, effort, and career defining uh, efforts that they put towards helping the people of Alabama and the government of Alabama work in a way that is going to be productive and secure for its people. Um, moving forward, I think that the most important actor in ensuring transparency for Alabamians are the people of Alabama calling on you to hold your elected officials accountable, to push for the public information that you want or need for the decisions that need to be made for your communities, your organizations, and your families. Uh, the ACLU is here to provide support, assistance, uh, and guidance to the extent that we can. And we hope that this is an effort that continues to move forward in a positive way. Thank you so much. Mr. Brassfield? Again, uh, I'll echo uh, the, the comments about thanking the League of Women Voters for bringing some focus on this issue this morning. Uh, you know, we have, um, you know, we're moving very, very hard to try to get our uh, meetings back in person. I know y'all are looking forward to, to that as well. Uh, but, but for those who don't know the effort that it takes to put together a virtual convention, there's nothing virtual about the hard work to, to get this together. Uh, and uh, I applaud you for making the extra effort to be able to gather as a group. Um, you know, for us, I think there are a couple of things that, that I hope have come through with regard to my comments. Uh, and, and that is that we, we see a difference between access to documents and access to, to information. And that as we move forward in trying to, to resolve that issue, we've, we've got to uh, take into account those differences. Uh, we also see a difference between access to information and, and the public body preparing and providing information. Uh, and and those, two, th those two things also have to be resolved uh, in some way for us to, to, to move forward. Uh, documents that, that the 67 county commissions hold that are not some other way protected by a court need to be accessible to you with a, with a time for response and you need to be able to follow up and get that information. Uh, research that we would have to do for you, that, that's a different issue and we need to find a way uh, to, to work that out. Um, I would say to you, the Press Association and the County Commission Association have, have, have worked out some difficult things over the years, uh, and we'll get this one worked out too. Um, you know, maybe not as fast as any one of us would like it to happen, but we'll get it worked out. Okay, and Ms. Mason, can you uh, close us out? Well, I, t I too wanted to thank the League of Women Voters for putting us all together and having the discussion. I think it's important. In progress. I think that, um, you know, the, the issue of public records isn't an issue until a citizen is denied, and then it becomes a very big issue. So the things that uh, we are working on in this, as you know now that you've heard, are not simple. And so um, I think um, Sonny and his group and the other groups are, that are working and, and my group included, we're committed to this. and We're committed to work on it. It's not going to be a quick and, and, you know, it's just not going to be, it's just not possible. But we have a history of being able to do that. And uh, we appreciate the other groups that come to the table and, um, and respect each other. It's just, um, you know, we've got to we've got to go through this process to get the best thing that we can get for our state. We certainly think there should be a time limit on um, the, the response time. We think there should be a limit on how much an entity can charge. Um, we think that because it, it, that shouldn't be a way to make it cost prohibitive. 
Uh, we think there should be the independent appeals process or something that looks somewhat like that. And there should be a penalty. There should be some teeth in the law. Those are the things that are most important to us. And the other groups have, have um, their, their um, um, important issues as well. But I think the message I would give to this group uh, and to the public at large is to be patient with us because we are really working on it. And these, the groups that are working on this have the best interests of the people of Alabama at heart. And I believe that. Well, thank you so much. On behalf of the League, I, I really want to thank you for spending your Saturday morning with us, for sharing your perspectives. It has been very informative um, on an issue that, as I'm sure you know, is near and dear to our hearts. So we just really appreciate you being giving your honest and, um, and informed opinions. So thank you so much. You're Have welcome. a good day. Thanks. Have a good day. Thank you.